Hey there, YouTube. Um, my son wanted a tabletop to put in his bedroom with a couple of metal brackets for support. Uh, so it's not going to have any legs. We went and looked at a couple of them at uh, Home Depot and Lowe's. They have some fancy hardwood ones, but uh, they're 135 bucks or something like that. He literally needs something that's about 20 by 36. So I said, well, let's check some other options out. We found this. Uh, these are two by twos. They're um, heat treated, as you can see by the stamp on there. All graded lumber will have a stamp on it, so you, you'll know if it's spruce pine fir, if it's dug fir, whatever. Uh, it should have a stamp on it. Not that you need that, but if you're doing anything structural down the line, it's helpful to know. Uh, this is dressed on two sides pretty well. This one and this one it should be opposite, but anyways, uh, this is really not very good wood, as you can see. I really only care about the top. So uh, what I'm going to do is I've cut these, pre-cut these. I bought a bunch of eight footers. Um, I cut them in half, and now I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to glue two sections together. I've got a 16-inch planer that I'm going to be able to run these through. And again, I really just care about the top, uh, the front, and the back edges. Obviously, have to be good. So I've oriented them so that anything like this is going to go on the inside. I'm going to have a clean outside edge. So these two go together. Nobody will ever know. Well, yes, if you look underneath the table later, you're going to see that. But I mean, again, it's for a high school kid that just wants a place to put uh, his computer. I'm going to be using these bar clamps. Uh, these are Pony. There's different brands of them nowadays. Uh, I've had these for a long time. If you don't have these and you do some woodworking, they're a pretty nice thing to get. There's a, a, a lot of different kinds of clamps out there. These have stood the test of time. They're really good. Basically, they come in a couple different sizes. These uh, use a three quarter inch pipe. You go down to your local plumbing supply or Home Depot. You get a section of pipe. It can be galvanized or black pipe. It doesn't really matter. You have them thread one end. This screws on. That end does not matter. In fact, if you buy one too long, you can cut it later. It doesn't affect anything. And uh, they're super great for gluing stuff. Um, I will tell you, if you use like tight bond, even Elmer's wood glue, any of the, the new glues they have out, these premium glues, if you get that drip on here, uh, it will stick to the metal. Uh, they don't put that on the glue bottle, but it does. And so you gotta try to keep those clean as much as possible. So anyways, we're gonna glue two sections together. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through how to glue them. Uh, if you have never done anything like this before, uh, you're thinking, well, I gotta use a plate joiner with biscuits, different sizes, or I've gotta dowel them. Not true, you do not have to do that. Uh, they have done electric guitar bodies for years with just glue. They've done dining room tables with just glue. Uh, probably all the furniture they ever made in North Carolina. Legs have dowels. You put a leg against the table, right? The frame of the table will have dowels in there, but the tabletop will not. Typically that's just glued, just like this. Even though these are nasty, it's the same principle. The only thing I will tell you that's something to pay attention to is all the wood that you're gonna find comes from a tree that was once round. So you're gonna have these growth rings, right? So I don't know if you can see these, but look for instance there, you can see the growth ring there. And these, I don't know, a little harder to see, but they kind of go up and down, okay? So the theory is, the legend has it, that we want to oppose the growth rings, okay? So this one's going that way, this one's going this way, okay? Whatever way you put them, just don't put them so that they both kind of make a complete circle. Because what will happen is eventually this will start pulling that way. You're going to get some checking anyways. You're going to get some things that are going to happen to this tabletop if that moisture content isn't low enough. And uh, it's going to continue to dry even though it's glued together. And it will pull. So just make sure to alternate your growth rings as best you can when you glue these together. And I've already done that here. And again, I've already oriented everything so that I'm gonna have a good edge on each side and the top is good. Whatever happens in the bottom happens on the bottom. So I'm not worried about at this point, uh, cutting anything down width-wise or cutting anything length-wise. I just did a random length. I think I cut these to 39 actually. So anyways, uh, let's get to it. Um, when we're done with that, I'm gonna drill one hole probably for his electronics, you know, for the cords to go through. And, uh, and then we'll probably have a trim router for the edges. We'll obviously be doing the planer. Um, again, we're gonna put two of these pieces together. We're gonna belt sand it, and then we're gonna coat it, clear coat it after we stain it. Um, we're either gonna use the pre-catalyzed lacquer, uh, if you've never used that. There's a brush on lacquer, which can be sprayed as well. Uh, there's also uh, two different kinds of polys. You've got a water base and an oil base. Poly I like, but it takes a long time to dry versus the lacquer. The lacquer dries very quickly and it can be sanded between coats. We'll get into that. I'll probably get in a little bit of um, 
HVLP spraying. If you've ever done that, um, you know there's not a lot of science to it, but <laughs> if you mess up one or two things, it, it, you'll have a kind of a bad day at the office with it. So we'll go over a couple things on that too. But right now, simple project, just something to get into if you've never done woodworking. Uh, you don't need 15 different kind of table saws. You don't need nail guns, pin nailers, you know, trim nailers, 16, 18 gauge grab nailers. You don't need any of that stuff. We're just gonna kind of do the basics. You can do this with a circular saw and you can do it without a planer. You're gonna have to use a belt sander and it's gonna take a little bit more elbow grease. But again, this is something anybody can do, okay? <laughs> okay, stop it. Tell me when you're... Okay, so as you can see, I've, uh, as we talked about, I've opposed the growth rings on the ends here. I just already went through and did that. And it's not always gonna be perfect. Sometimes you're gonna get two growth rings. You're just gonna have a situation where maybe, maybe the, you know, there's still quite a bit of this, you know, rough looking wood and it's just not gonna play out, okay? But for the most part, I've got them opposed so that they're sort of gonna fight each other throughout eternity. And uh, I've got the glue applied. There's all kinds of glue dispenser bottles. There's fancy different ways to dispense glue for me. It has always worked out pretty good to use a Bondo applicator or a brush, but you can do whatever you want. I put down um, just a tarp under here, an old tarp, because I just haven't figured out a good way after 30 or 40 years of doing this to not make a mess. It's like somebody that bakes all the time. Um, I prefer just to get it done and I clean up afterwards. You know, If you're worried about keeping everything neat, then good for you, but I'm not that good of a person. So um, I do this this way, I stack it up this way. Obviously it's easier, now I can apply this edge and then I can go to the next and the next. So I will uh, cut this now, we'll finish the rest of this, and I'll show you the clamping procedure. Okay, so um, we've got everything lined up right here. I try to space, I'm gonna use four clamps, four of the pipe clamps on this. Always, you, you wanna grab the ends first, of course, and then you wanna look for gaps in the wood. I don't know if you can see these, but um, there's a couple in here, and, and you need to just kind of it's sort of Kentucky windage. You're gonna space these accordingly. This one worked out better, keeping it about two inches from the end. This one worked out about five inches from the end. So um, it just depends on how this stuff is checking and, and uh, sort of how it's bowed from sitting at that nasty pile at Home Depot. And again, if you were to look, you know, if you were to get down real low and look across, you would see this thing just going, I mean, zigzag city. So um, get, it, get it clamped, not all the way yet, but get it clamped to where you've got the glue oozing out wipe this we're gonna flip it around we're gonna put a clamp here and a clamp here and then we're gonna crank them all down okay so we flipped it around and like I said uh, sort of on the intro the bottom of this is not pretty that's not gonna get we're not using wood filler or anything else in here we're just gonna keep it as is uh, the bottom is what it is so if you've used these clamps before the object of the game is to is if when you start using it you want to make sure you run this up as far as you can so pretty close to all the way up and then you're just gonna these just operate by pushing it together okay and we're just gonna put a little tension on it right now and of course they like to move so uh, do the same with this one and sometimes you have to hold on these dogs right here or it'll start slipping it'll go ahead and spin and spin and spin what will happen is this this screw will go in but that'll continue to move so sometimes you get to hold these with your thumb if they're older like mine you know that have had since like Nixon was president but uh, as you can see, you will be able to find out how well you're doing by the amount of glue that's oozing out of here. And again, don't be bashful with the glue. Use plenty of it, wipe it off afterwards. And then depending on time of year, where you're at, um, it's probably a good idea to go 24 hours with the glue um, or at least 12 to 18 or something like that. And uh, just give this a real good chance to dry up because you are, there's a lot of, lot of glue in here and you wanna make sure it's fully dried before you unclamp it. The longer you leave it clamped, the better the odds this is gonna be an extremely strong project. And as I mentioned again, you're gonna get glue on these pipe clamps and this will stick to them. I don't know why it doesn't say, <laughs> it's like latex paint, you know, they tell you to prep a wall for 55 hours so the paint will stick. Go ahead and get a tiny little bit of overspray on your car. It takes you a day and a half to get it off. It'll stick to everything but what it's supposed to, right? So this does stick to pipe clamps. It will ruin your day with your pipe clamp. I try to get that. And again, use a damp rag. Don't use paper towels. Uh, I mean, you can use paper towels. It's just so much easier to do this with warm water on it. Wipe it all off. And uh, we're going to finish this one. We're going to do the next one. Then we'll be back. Okay, as you can see, uh, everything's glued up. We've got two of these. We are going to um, be planing them now just to knock them down. 
We're gonna do the bottoms first. I always like to do the bottoms first just because as they run through the planer, if you were to do the top first, get that all cleaned up, then flip it over, you're gonna get marks like that. Uh, so I wanna, I wanna go ahead and do any of the denting or scratching to the top uh, while I do the bottom. Then we'll flip it over and we'll just get all those blemishes off. The idea is that both pieces are gonna be exactly the same and we're gonna go ahead and glue them together. And again, I'm not going to use, um, I'm not gonna use any dowels. I'm not gonna use any biscuits. I'm just gonna go ahead and glue them together just like I did with these pieces. Uh, so I'll show you what they look like when we're done. Okay, so here's what it looks like now. We've got the two separate pieces. A um, little bit of a, a kind of a kind of a puzzle as far as trying to figure out, you know, what piece to put on what side. Put this this piece on that side or that piece on that side, and it's anybody's guess really. But the object is you want the, the least amount of gap in the project uh, for the clamps to fight in. And this is not too bad. You can see I got a little bit of fill to do here when we're done, but this is the top. You get some of this chipping when you run anything through a planer. And again, you can do this with a belt sander, it just takes you a little bit longer. Uh, the bottom, uh, I usually just clean that up, um, you know, just so it's uniform, but you know, you're not gonna fill these gaps. I don't care about the bottom. That's the bottom of a table. I could really care less. If we start working on the bottom of the table, that means the earth is upside down and I'm gonna be doing something different anyway. So. Anyways, that's what she's going to look like. Uh, this looks like, again, the left piece, and this looks like the right piece, or whatever way you're standing. Uh, we will dress the ends afterwards. We'll drill the hole, and we'll take the trim router, and we'll round off all the edges. But uh, for now, I'm going to go ahead and glue this piece to that piece, and I don't want to bore you with the clamp deal. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and do it, and then we'll be right back. Okay, so the tabletop is done. We've got the, uh, I just took the clamps off it. You can see we've got one glue line right now here. So we didn't have that much uh, bleed out actually on it. So that was pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Well, we clamped it together. We tried to get it as close as we could so there wouldn't be that big of a, a burr edge right there to deal with with, with uh, the belt sander. But where we're at now is we've got to cut this thing to length. It's going to be 36 inches long. The width of it's not going to change. We're going to leave that exactly the same, but we are going to cut each end. And as you can see, when we glued them, we didn't really care that much about being you know straight. In fact, I left the tags on here. so. Whenever you cut a top like this, you can do it a couple different ways. You can use a table saw, you can use a circular saw, uh, you can even use a hand saw if you don't have anything available. But the idea is you always want the splintering from your cut to go on the bottom side. So we're gonna flip this over. I went ahead, I've already made with my carpenter's square. Um, I've made marks already. You can do this a couple different ways. Uh, some people like to go ahead and put the edge of the square flat with the edge of the piece. Some people, I prefer to kind of rest it in here and touch it to there and just kind of slide this back and forth i made a pencil mark on both sides over here and over here so we've now got 36 inches from each side now i can freehand that i'm going to use it just a regular circular saw i can freehand that or i can do one better you can do this with a level you can do this with um really any kind of tool you want to do it with but um i, I bought this at lowe's a number of years back and these work really really well uh, for a straight edge this clamps on here and you can run your saw uh, right down this for a straight edge. So obviously you don't put it right on the on the pencil mark because you need to account for the, the plate, the, the shoe of the saw. So this particular saw right here, and this is not plugged in, don't worry. Look. Um, it's five inches from the inside of the blade to the edge of the shoe. So what I did was I made a pencil mark right here, five inches, five inches, and I'm literally just gonna clamp this right here on that five inch mark and i'm going to go ahead and tighten it up so again you can do um like a four foot level and just use like jorgensen clamps or any kind of a speed clamp for it and this will move you know the only thing i don't like about this is it moves around about 17 times while you're clamping it okay here we go So uh, I've got an inch and three quarter. There's a couple different ways to do this. I wanted to put a hole here just so we could put cords and all that stuff through uh, the top. 
Uh, inch and three quarters seems to be a pretty good size, but you could certainly go inch and a half or even a little smaller. I just didn't want there to be a whole lot of fussing around when he wanted to put stuff through here. So I just marked off 18 inches is the center between 36 inch top. So I've got an 18 inch mark there and I, I measured inch and three quarter in. That'll give us a little bit of room. Um, if you've never used one of these, it's always a wise idea to go as far as, you can technically go all the way through the piece. You're gonna splinter the heck out of it when you get through the bottom side. So what I like to, what I like to do is go through with the pilot bit until it shows through the other side. Then I'll flip this around and then we'll start from the other side and kind of join those two. Oftentimes you don't get a perfectly even hole, but oftentimes you do. So it's just kind of a luck of the draw. Uh, we'll go ahead and get that as fast as we can here. we're through to the point where we can see the pilot bit where it's come through right here so we'll just go ahead and go the rest of the way with this okay so if you look in here you can see right now that I came from the top and the bottom I don't know if you can get you know kind of get in there and see that but there's sometimes there's a ridge in there um, we got pretty lucky on this one so it looks pretty good so I'm gonna go ahead now and we're gonna router out this we're gonna router all the top edges with a, a rounding bit on the uh, trim router. And uh, I'll show you that in just a second. Okay, so this is just a regular trim router and I've got uh, a rounding bit on here and you can orient it any way you want really. Uh, this particular one has the bearing, it'll ride alongside the piece. Um, I usually set this up so it's just about even, the plate is just about even with that top edge. So you're gonna get uh, a cut that's just about perfect. It'll look very natural. When you use a router, uh, obviously never, never, never use the router with it. <laughs> adjust the bit with this thing plugged in. I actually have had this up against my chest before, changing bits with it on uh, when I was a much younger guy. And uh, I can show you coveralls that have the buttons completely ripped off and holes in my clothing. Uh, and fortunately, no holes in my stomach. But this is a serious business thing. They spin at extremely high RPM, so you got to be very safe with them. And always, uh, you know, hearing protection and, and eye protection too. So when you use a router, there'll be a tendency for it to, the direction of travel for the router is going to, it's gonna to wanna to force it, if you're on the outside edge, it's gonna to wanna to force it along the piece. You wanna always fight the direction of that. You wanna bring it against its natural tendency to go away, okay? And the reason why is it can skip and split and you'll get stuff like this that the planer did. You'll get that same kind of an edge on the side. So we'll do that in a second, I'm gonna plug this in. Okay, so when you start, you never wanna start on the end, at least I don't like to start on the end. Um, again, you wanna be pushing on this, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. This router, um, the way it spins, it's gonna to wanna to pull towards me. I wanna push it away, and I wanna do it gently so I don't get any of the, the chipping, but here we go. Okay, the ends are a little tougher. You can do these either way. Um, again, I like to come at, I like to come against the direction of the router. If you come on the end grain, if you come this way, you can crack that right off. So you can go ahead and bring it in from the end. There you go. So we'll go ahead and finish this out, and then we'll do this one as well. Very easy to do these holes. So that'll just be one less sharp edge. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this up. And we'll, uh, we'll sand it after that. Okay, so she's all done. I've got all the edges routered, as you can see. Um, and we're a little rough at this point because we still have to belt sand. But as you can see, it's uh, 
just the top edge. I didn't go ahead and do the bottom. Not really a big need for that. Where I did do the bottom edge was in the front. So when you're looking at the front of the tabletop, you know, right here, you're gonna have a smooth edge, you know, to put your leg against or whatever. So um, super important that you, you think about these things ahead of time, because if you decide later, you already get stain and clear coat on it. It's a little tough to do it then, but anyways, uh, really simple project. And again, on the router, personal preference, I just tell you my thoughts uh, on the end grain. I have found that if you don't go in and start this way and then finish the ends uh, afterwards, you can get splitting. You can start on an end and go in. But the problem is when you get to this end and you're going out, you're, that's where you're going to get your chip. So uh, if you want to start in the end, that's fine. Just start, go. You get to here, bring it out, and then come back from the other side. You won't have that splitting. If you look, I don't... I don't have splitting on any of my corners. And again, you can do it whatever way you want, whatever way feels comfortable. It just, in my opinion, it feels more natural to move the router uh, where I feel the resistance instead of where I feel it pulling on itself, you know, because you have more control that way. But at any rate, uh, we're gonna get the belt sander out now. Uh, first, what I'll probably do before we sand it is I'm gonna go ahead and put some filler in here. And uh, I'm just gonna fill some of these gaps before I belt sand it. And if this is a finished piece, like I've done electric guitar bodies, I've done things like that. And I can tell you, depending on the clear coat that you use and how clear, a, a, you know, how smooth a finish you want, there's a lot of different ways to finish a piece of wood. You can use what they call a sanding sealer. The sanding sealer will, um, will really get rid of some of the pores. If a uh, pre-catalyzed lacquer, uh, for instance, you can do, I like working with it. I've worked with it for years. It makes a fantastic finish. It can be sanded between coats, wet sanded, or just dry sanded actually. And then uh, between coats, and then you can go ahead and buff it afterwards. Uh, so you can cut it down, do a couple different buffing pads, and you can get a mirror finish on that, like the hood on a Corvette. The problem is lacquer, if you have little grainy things, it will continue to fill those. It will never, like this right here, this ridge, will never disappear. You'll get eight or 10 coats of lacquer on this piece of wood and it will never ever go away. You think, well, I'll just build it up and then I'll sand it in. But every time you fill it, every time you spray that lacquer, it'll go and it'll assume that same shape. So you'd want to use like a sanding sealer for that. So for this particular project, I'm just going to fill some of these things. Again, I haven't decided on pre cap lacquer yet or if I'm just going to do a poly or if it's going to be water-based or oil-based, but um, I'm going to go ahead and apply some, some filler to this. I'll let it dry and then I'll belt sand it. It's very similar to what a hardwood flooring contractor would do at your house. Um, it's a pretty wise way to do it because you get grain rays typically with any kind of a water-based product. So if you put like a, a, a putty in here, you're gonna, the, the grain will swell. So if you sand it first and say, oh, I just have a few things to fill. It's not like doing the fender on your car, okay? If you, if you touch water to wood, it's going to swell up and you're going to have a spot there that needs to be completely resanded. So do that ahead of time if you can, and you'll eliminate a lot of work on the back end. And again, this isn't, you know, a table for a, a fine furniture store. This is just a, a work table for my son. So I'm just using uh, plastic wood. You can get this at uh, Home Depot. This is the stuff that turns colors when it's dry, but um, works pretty good. I mean, just as lousy or as good as anything else. So um again anytime you put this on the wood what you're going to find i found in the past is this will stain the wood so if you want to do it um before you do any heavy sanding because it'll take that away if you scrape it right down like that it's going to shrink and i recommend you leave it a little bit above even though if you're, if you're really snazzy with a putty knife and you can make it look real pretty um just go ahead and leave it a little bit above like that i'm going to just go ahead and hit all the spots here then we'll uh we're going to let this dry overnight and then I'll, we'll sand it tomorrow Okay, so uh, everything's dry. I went a little overboard with the wood putty and I just kind of skimmed it like uh, like you would probably with auto body or whatever, but there were just so many voids and so many scratches, I decided to just go ahead and put a light coat on it. This is extremely messy when you sand it, if you've never done it before. Um, obviously I'm outside, I do a lot of work outside, that way I don't have to deal with the, the dust mess inside. But uh, I'm gonna go ahead and belt sand this first, knock all this down, uh, the belt, I've got, I think, is a 60 grit, if I'm not mistaken. And then I'm going to go to uh, dual action, either electric or air. I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll grab one out of, out of my, my garage. But uh, I like to use a 150 with the dual action after I go over this with the belt. And then be careful because I've already radius the edges. If you sand real hard uh, here, you're going to change the shape of that radius, right? If you go down too low, it's not going to be the same radius that it is right now. 
So I always kind of use some caution. I don't go crazy on this. I just do enough, obviously, where we brought these two pieces together. I've got a ridge right there I've got to get out. And I'm just kind of going to go through everything. I'm going to get all this loose stuff up, and uh, I'm going to get it to where we can go with the dual action sander. So I'm going to grab that right now, and uh, I'm, I'm going to do it to it. Now, when you use a belt sander, if you've never used one before, super easy. The trick is keep it moving. If you stop for a second, you're going to get a divot. If you go side to side, you're probably going to get a divot in the wood. It's just they're very aggressive. Just keep it moving front to back. Do not go side to side. Just front to back as you move, okay? I'll keep going with this and then uh, as soon as it's gonna take me a little while I don't want to bore you to tears but uh, I'm gonna keep on with this we'll get it all knocked down and then we'll go with the dual action center okay so the belt sanding's done uh, pretty happy with the way it came out I've got some ridges in here that I've got to take out but I, I really just concentrated on trying to go evenly again when you use a belt sander it's no big deal if you screw up hey it's wood you can sand it out but uh, you always want to move in the direction of the grain and you can see now where we clamped it and we used a lot of glue. Um, there really aren't that many voids in here. There's a few, but it looks like it just was a cutting board we just bought someplace uh, for a lot of money. And it really is obviously just uh, 23 bucks worth of wood or whatever it was. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hit it with this. I've got a couple of air sanders that I may uh, opt to use after this. I'm gonna see what I can do with this just to really get it to where I like it. This is a 120 grit paper, so I'm just gonna get started with that. <laughs> So we're all we're all ready to go. Um, we did. The, I was going to change um, the grid of the paper from 120 and, and maybe do 150, 180. Um, but I have found in the past that you can use a 220, a 400 grid. You can get this like a baby's bottom, smooth as glass. But the thing is, you want your finish to be able to stick to this. So you really don't want to go that fine with your sandpaper. You want to go probably 120 or 150, and that's it. A car, totally different thing. You want to do, you know, 400, 600. You, you really want an automotive finish to be different. That's a total different type of work that we're talking about here. And I do I do a little of both, so uh, we'll cover that if I do another video on some other, other stuff. But anyways, with this, 120 is great. I hand sanded afterwards. Uh, we did the end. You'll be able to tell. When you sand end grain, um, it's hard to tell when it's smooth enough. It's, it's not ever gonna be probably as smooth as, as the top. It's just a different feel. It will be as smooth, but when you can see the grain, you know you've pretty much done your job, okay? So the grain's very apparent here. Um, and you can also see how lousy this wood, we took some really lousy wood, right? When you look at this, we took some very lousy wood, we glued it together, and I tried to alternate, you know, understanding when we stain it, it's all gonna stain a different color, right? It's never going to be that perfect cutting, you know, from where we bought this wood, it's not going to be the perfect cutting board with maple and sherry and maple, you know what I mean? But, you know, you do have different colors, so I tried to separate them, you know, add a little character to it. But uh, anyways, as far as applying stain, the best way to do it is whatever way is best for you. You can use, you can brush it on and then wipe it with a rag. You can spray it on with a sprayer and then wipe it off, um, you know, that way too. It's really up to you. I just like taking a piece of old rag and dipping it in and I just kind of move it around and I do it that way. So I'll just go ahead and stain this. Uh, we're doing a gray on this. I really like the gray. This is a very porous wood. It's gonna come out really nice. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and stain this up and then I will uh, uh, we'll go from there and we'll uh, go on to the clear coat once this is all done. But this is what she's gonna look like. Okay, so we've got the stain on here. Again, uh, that 120 grit, the 150 grit is kind of the magic spot because that really allows the wood, it's still kind of rough enough for the, to really draw that stain in. And you can see the different variations in the grain. Uh, so I like the gray, it highlights a lot. Um, it's, you know, obviously user preference, but we'll go ahead and let this dry. Uh, I did do the bottom. 
just to have it done, but you can really see how, you know, incredibly lousy this wood was. It really only had one good side and we've got that one facing up. But you know, if you're looking for an inexpensive way to make a table, some kind of a desk like this, this is a really cool project, didn't take very long. Um, and again, if you don't have all the tools, you can do this with very basic tools. It just takes a little bit longer. And um, anyways, we'll, uh, we'll catch you in a, tomorrow. We'll go ahead and clear coat this and we'll, uh, we'll see how she comes out. I haven't decided yet. I'm probably gonna use a water-based poly, uh, but we will be spraying and I'll be talking to you a little bit about that. Okay, so we're getting ready to spray. Again, uh, when you use an HVLP sprayer, I would use the 3 8 hose instead of the quarter inch. You can see it's quite a bit of difference in the amount of airflow you're gonna get out of the 3 8 versus, this is just a hose that I use for air tools, uh, impact guns, that kind of stuff. And it works really well for that, nail guns, things like that. But when you're spraying, you wanna get that airflow. So that's why it's gonna be a high volume gun. That's really what makes it a high volume gun is you've gotta put that volume of air in there to atomize the paint. Um, we are just using, I looked around what I had on hand. Um, I'm gonna use this, it's actually an exterior, um, water-based clear coat and it's a satin finish this works real good um, obviously I'm doing this for something indoors but it's a little overkill I had it I had it laying around uh, again I use a lot of times I'll use the t77 f38 the Sherwood um, that is from Sherwin Williams that is a pre-catalyzed lacquer that they pre-catalyze in the shop for you and if you use their stain you can put the stain on and and the uh, clear coat same day if not, you, if you're using like a pre-catalyzed lacquer product and use like a Minwax stain, you're gonna have to wait 24 to 48 hours for that wood to completely feel dry. If you put that on wood that has not completely dried, if that stain is not completely dried, it's gonna, it's gonna peel right off, okay? These are compatible, they play well together. I've done a lot of woodworking projects with these two. Um, as far as straining, uh, filtering your paint, it's a great idea. If you do it with this, this is a dull rubbed finish. Um, so it's going to give you that satin look. If you filter that, it will take the sheen out of it. You will get a, you'll get a very glossy coat. Okay. If you, if you, um, go ahead and filter that paint. So I pretty much don't filter it unless I'm doing automotive work. Um, yeah. Do, every once in a while, do you get something block up the needle valve? Yep. You sure do. Um, and does it make me mad? Absolutely. It sure does. So right now I'm going to put this in here again. I talked to you about the adjustments of your um, kind of the, the spray pattern, the limiter, and keeping that open. And I'm doing a, when I've got this trigger pulled, I'm doing about 18 pounds right there. So that's, that's about as much as I wanna do right now. Uh, first order of business on the project is we're gonna go ahead and do the sides and the bottom, just kind of seal them up. We're gonna do a couple coats of that and uh, then we'll be good to go. Okay, so we're gonna do the edges first. I'm gonna keep probably I don't know, about 10 inches away. And I'm just gonna go over it real quick. The idea here is we're just gonna seal it, okay? This is just a seal coat. This isn't for, for look. Um, I like to go over everything twice. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of overspray. I like to do this outside. And again, I'm just putting two coats back and forth. And when you spray, you wanna grab on the trigger before you hit the wood. You don't want to grab on it just as you hit the wood. You want to grab on it here, bring it across straight, and then let go, right? So you don't want to have any spots where you're just turning it on here, turning it off there, because you're going to get a very sand-like finish. Okay, we'll get the last edge. I didn't leave myself a lot of room, did I? do the top. I usually just take and air it off first in case there's any dust. I just squeeze on it lightly. Right now there's nothing coming out. I go a little bit closer on this and I go wet edge to wet edge. Alright, coat number one done. Okay, so uh, one coat's on, and I took some 220 uh, sandpaper and just lightly kind of scuffed it up because a lot of times, especially with the water-based finishes, 
um, you'll get some grain rays, you'll get some kind of, it'll feel like a, a sheet of sandpaper, it'll feel like a sheet of uh, 150 grit sandpaper. So I just kind of knock that down a little bit and then I'll go ahead and uh, do the next coat. Then we'll flip it around and we'll do three coats on the top. But I just want two coats on the bottom, just kind of seal it up. I'm gonna seal the end grain. Every time I coat this top, I'm gonna coat the edges. So the edges will end up with quite a few coats on them um, and they'll be quite a bit smoother. And uh, obviously the bottom is just literally, like I said, to seal it up. It's, it's not that appealing, but um, it doesn't have to be. So, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and do the next coat now and then we'll flip it over. Okay, uh, bottom's done. Again, we're gonna do the sides and we're gonna do the top. All right, gonna do another coat. I did uh, a light sanding on here just to get uh, get it smoothed out with uh, 220. And we'll go ahead and I'm just gonna do the three edges and the top. I'm not gonna do the back edge now, no need to. Okay, last coat here. I think uh, we've got it pretty good now. There's uh, two pretty thick coats, 220, again, in between each one, just to kind of knock it down gently. I don't use a sandy block, just with my hand. And that knocked it down good. This is a satin finish, so again, I'm gonna do these three sides. This one goes against the wall. I'm not so worried about it. I just did it to seal it, so there we go. That last coat I put on pretty thick, so it'll dry up good. Okay, here's the finished product. There's uh, three coats of clear on the top and uh, two on the bottom, and of course about five on the sides. Uh, I like to do the edges every time I, I do the top or the bottom, I always hit the edges. And the reason why is because the grain <clears throat> is very porous on the ends. So that end grain, uh, it takes quite a bit of clear to fill it. And again, if you really want a, a gloss, you can see the pores of the wood right here. If you want to get rid of those, you can use a sanding sealer. Do a couple coats of that first. There's a few different brands. Minmax makes one. Uh, of course, all the, the major uh, paint stores make them as well. Uh, and uh, again, water-based versus oil-based, it's up to you. I use both. I don't really uh, have a preference one over the other. It's just whatever I have on hand at the time I'm doing a project. But I think she came out pretty good, all things considered. Um, but yeah, looks good. And uh, this will be my son's desktop now. So. Um, hopefully it uh, gives you a little bit better understanding at least of how I do things and everybody has a different way of doing them again you can do uh, a variety of different tools when you do a project like this you don't need a, a hole saw for this hole you can use a jigsaw you don't have to router the the outer edges you don't have to round those off you can use a belt sander you can use a hand sander you can do it any way you want it's just a fun project I think I got about twenty five dollars or twenty six dollars into this so anyways uh, have fun thanks again for watching